Okay. Hello, everyone. Everyone, again, my name is Aisha Green. I'm one of the coordinators for ACC's Student Money Management Office. Our office was established to educate ACC students on how to take control over their finances. And we do that a number of ways by offering um, these sort of workshops, understanding credit and paying down debt. We offer a number of workshops. We partnered with our effective learning classes. And so we go into the um, EDUC 1300 uh, classes and conduct these uh, sessions. And from those conversations, students are invited to schedule an individual coaching session with our office. And during the coaching sessions, we work with students with creating semester spending plans, um, saving for their financial futures. If students need guidance on how to open up a Roth IRA, if students wanna learn how to establish credit, improve credit, pay down debt, we work with students in, uh, in that capacity. We also have a peer money mentor program where we take a select group of ACC students and train them on various money management topics. And at the end of the program, those students are given a $600 stipend from our office. Uh, we partnered with University Federal Credit Union and Trellis Company uh, to incentivize ACC students up to $100 to open up savings accounts with uh, University Federal Credit Union. And we have close to uh, 600, 600 students enrolled in the program and collectively they've saved over $150,000 and we're so excited about that. Um, one of the ways that we're able to stay in contact with our students is through our text messaging program. And what we do with our text messaging program is remind students of financial aid deadlines, payment deadlines, scholarship deadlines, when it's time to register for uh, summer classes, fall classes, and spring classes, we remind them of that. So anytime you receive any sort of correspondence from our office um, asking you to opt into our text messaging program, um, we encourage you to do so. This is our team and our goal is to integrate financial education into every aspect of the student experience, which is why we have the type of programming uh, that we have. Uh, we encourage students to connect with us on our one social media platform, which is uh, Instagram. Our peer money mentors create content specifically for our um, uh, Instagram page for ACC students. And then I would encourage you all to explore our website, austincc.edu backslash money. We have some amazing resources on our website and a, um, uh, an awesome uh, online learning platform that can take you a bit further and give you a really good foundation uh, in the area of financial wellness. And then during the course of our conversation today, if you feel uncomfortable asking a question, you can send us a question at money at austincc.edu and we'll, re we'll respond to that question. My director actually looks at that uh, email um, every single day. And if it's something that I can um, assist with, she'll send it over to me. So again, um, we're excited to be here and to uh, share this information uh, with you. So this presentation is going to be a two-parter. Hopefully you're able to um, follow along with your computer and take some notes. I encourage you to take some screenshots. It is packed with a lot of information, which is why I would encourage you, if you want to learn more, you need some assistance, uh, to schedule an individual coaching session with me. I've opened up some dates um, in April as well as in May. And so we can work one-on-one -on -one, uh, to whatever it is that you want to cover as long as it's a financial uh, wellness topic. So the first part of the presentation, we're gonna talk about credit, like everything and how it impacts you. Um, and then the second part, how to pay down debt and how to get it paid down quickly so you can free up that money to save and to also um, invest. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, so the first part, how does credit work? What's in your credit report? How to establish credit? We'll talk about how to improve your credit, uh, credit scores and more credit myths busted. I love busting credit myths. And then we're gonna look at how do you go about paying down debt? 
So the first question, and you can put your responses um, in a chat, is why do you think excellent credit is important? Why do you think excellent credit is important? And you can put your responses in a chat. And then Trish, if you can read some of the responses uh, for me, once they come in, why do you think excellent credit is important? You can put it in the chat or you can take yourself off mute. <laughs> We had a shy group on the call today. There we go. It shows responsibility. It does show responsibility. It also shows how you're able to handle other people's money because you're brought, when you're borrowing um, money from you know a credit card company, a mortgage company, or uh, you're financing a vehicle, how well you're able to pay that back. You know, so yes, it definitely shows uh, your, 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 your responsibility. And what else do you have, Trish? We have better interest rates. That's and, right. Yeah. Go ahead. And you can get a car without issues. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. important. Yeah, it is. that is important. So yeah, so what I tell students is that when you have excellent credit, so you can get things when you have good credit, fair credit, you know, um, you can you, you still can get things, but when you have excellent credit, you get the premium interest rates. You're not charged a whole lot to, to finance things. And that's why uh, you wanna um, aim for excellent credit, especially before you make major purchases like financing a vehicle or uh, buying a home. You know, we tell students that your credit can impact your quality of life because it can affect where you live, your stress levels, and it could be the difference between having an affordable lifestyle and a super expensive lifestyle. And a super expensive lifestyle, you know, it impacts so many things. So say for instance, your car insurance rates. So your car insurance rates aren't just based on your gender, your age, where you live, but it's also based on your credit score, okay? So your car insurance rates are also based on your credit score. And then 25% of employers will pull a modified version of your credit report. And this is so important because we work hard in school, um, we position ourselves to uh, get promotions and to advance our career. And the higher you go up, you know, you may be required to go through a very extensive background check, which includes um, having your credit report pulled. And so you want to be mindful of that. And then just going back to the interest rates, you know, you don't want to uh, end up financing a vehicle and getting stuck with a 12, 13, 14 percent interest rate on your vehicle or even a mortgage, having a high interest rate on a mortgage, that can be thousands of dollars that you pay out compared to someone who has excellent credit. So your credit can impact so many things, which is why it's, it's important, in my opinion, for students to establish credit while they're in college. And so we can help you with that. How does credit work? So in, in the middle of this screen here, you see the names of the three credit reporting agencies, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. You know, they run the game when it comes to credit. And so your mortgage lenders, your credit card companies, um, they all report how you're um, able to, uh, how, how you make your payments. So if you're paying on time, if you're paying late, uh, any sort of uh, credit that you have out there as far as loans, all of those things are going to be reported to the three credit reporting agencies. And then the other thing that you need to be aware of um, would be delinquent accounts that aren't considered you know, accounts that you're necessarily financing. So say for instance, um, your utilities, um, if you, or cable. So if you become delinquent or default on your um, utilities or on your cable bill, they'll report that information to the three credit reporting agencies. Uh, say for instance, if you're paying rent on time or you're paying your phone bill on time, uh, that's not going to be reported to the three credit reporting agencies. But if you go delinquent or, or if you default on that, then it will be reported. The other thing that you wanna be aware of is that they're always capturing your, your personal information. So that's your name, date of birth, social security number, that sort of thing. And so if you have a common name 
Um, especially if you have a common name, you definitely want to go through your uh, credit report with the fine tooth comb because these um, creditors, when they send your information over uh, to the three credit reporting agencies, uh, they send it over in a batch file and sometimes errors can happen. And so if you have a common name, definitely go through it with the fine tooth comb. And then if you're a male um, and you share a name with your dad, so if you're a junior, uh, you definitely want to look at your credit report and make sure your dad's information is it showing up on your credit report? Now, your credit report, we call it like your, your, your college transcript, you know, all the classes that you've taken, right? All the credit you've taken out and the grades that you received in those classes, right? Um, and your grades would be just based on how you're um, handling your uh, credit limits and your payment history. And then based on the information uh, that's in your credit report, uh, each of these entities will assign you a credit score. And as you can see, these credit scores are different because you know there is not a requirement for you know a particular creditor to have to uh, report your information to the three credit reporting agencies. And so some will report, say for instance, to Experian and Equifax, and may not report your information to TransUnion. TransUnion. And so this is why it's important. Uh, to look at pulling all three of your credit reports. Uh, right now, because of COVID, the, you, can, you can pull your credit report uh, once a week at no cost. Um, before COVID happened, we would tell students, you know, you would want to pull your credit report in three to four months increments. So say for instance, you pull Experian, wait three to four months, pull Equifax, wait three to four months, and then pull TransUnion. And then that way you're able to monitor your credit uh, throughout the year and you don't have to pay for a credit monitoring uh, agency to do that for you. Where do you go to pull your credit report? You wanna go to annualcreditreport.com. I know a lot of students like to go to Credit Karma, but you cannot get all three credit reports at Credit Karma. So to get all three of your credit reports, you wanna to go to annualcreditreport.com. Now, again, um, because of COVID, you can um, pull your report more frequently um, than before COVID. Before COVID, one free credit report a year, uh, since COVID, you're able to pull your credit report at least once a week. And I think it has to do with like all the scams and things that are happening um, because of COVID and people calling uh, to get you to uh, provide information for vaccines and, and things like that. And so they just want to be, they want you to be super careful and try to stay on top of um, monitoring your credit. Now, what's included in your credit report? This is a sample of um, a, an Experian uh, credit report. And like I said before, it's your personal information. So you definitely you want to make sure that they don't have you living in um, a city or a state that you've never lived in before. So that's important. Uh, you want to make sure your name is spelled correctly. Uh, they don't have your date of birth off, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then some of the, the activities that shows up on your uh, credit report would be like bankruptcy or if you owe back child support, that will show up on your credit report um, as well. Now, and Aisha, we do have a question that came in about the current topic. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question about, can you get a credit report without a social security number? No, you because your social security number helps to identify you. So you definitely need to be able to connect that information. Um, and so uh, I think it's a it's called an EIN number um, that you'll need to get if you don't have um, a social security number. Um, but you definitely need to have a social security number or um, an EIN number to do that. Thank you. Okay. But yeah, employer identification number. All right. So how long does derogatory information stay on your credit report? And so this, I would take a screenshot of this particular slide. Um, and you know, look at how long, like say for instance, late payment. So if you're 30 days late one time, 
making your car payment, your mortgage payment, your student loan payment, your credit card payment, just one time, it stays on your credit report for seven years. That's a long time. And this is why, you know, with, within our department, we, we start out everything in conversations with students is that you have to create a budget. You need to know what's going on with your money so that you um, are able to handle all of your expenses. But if you're not budgeting, you're not tracking your expenses, you know, when things come up, uh, you never know how you're going to be able to handle those things if you don't have an emergency fund. And if you get in a situation where you're unable to make those uh, payments, you know, car payments, student loan payments, mortgage payments, credit card payments, um, you know, it can really impact your credit score as well as your credit report. And then look at the collection accounts. That's seven years plus um, 180 days. And I, I am going to have a conversation about um, collections uh, in just a minute, because I feel that it's important, but I don't have slides in here for that. Um, the, the last thing before we go further into collection accounts is that uh, student loans. So with student loans, they don't automatically fall off of your credit report. So if you get in a situation where you default on a student loan, understand it's not going to automatically fall off of your uh, credit report like these uh, collection accounts will. And so we tell students, when it comes to student loans, understand you should only borrow what you need. And the best way to determine what you need as far as student loans is to do a semester spending plan. And we have that tool on our website. So as far as collections, there's a couple of things that you know I wanna mention with uh, collections. So it, when you pull your credit report, and if you see that you have collection accounts um, on your credit report, and if they're old uh, collection accounts, they've already done damage uh, to your credit score. And so there's nothing really that you can do to that specific account to uh, boost your credit score. And so what we explain to students is that, you know, if it's a collection account that's six years old, you know, just go ahead and let that thing fall off of your um, credit um, report. Let it fall off. If it's, you know, getting close to falling off, let it fall off. You know, don't even try to have a conversation uh, with the uh, collection agencies. Okay, so when it's getting close and if you don't have any plans to make any major purchases, you know, within, you know, the next year, year or so, just let it fall off. The other thing that you need to understand is that with collections, okay, that means a third party has bought your debt. And when they purchase your debt, they purchase your debt for pennies on the dollar, okay? So say for instance, if your debt was $1, the collection agency probably bought your debt for 30 cents, okay? And so if you say to me, Miss Aisha, this collection account, it's only been on my um, credit report for two years. It's only been reported for two years. I have five years. And so you wanna do something about it. Then we say, all right, so then you want them to validate the debt because here's another thing that you need to know when your one dollar debt is purchased with just 30 cents they're probably not buying all the paperwork that's associated with that debt and so before you decide to um you know negotiate to get it paid off in full have them validate the debt and so you can do that by sending them a debt validation letter and trish this will be the perfect time to um, put the link in the chat for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Okay, and if y'all still with me, I want you to put a five in the chat because I'm gonna expand on this just a little bit more. If you're still with me, put five in the chat. So if it's getting close to falling off and you don't have any plans to make any major purchases, let it fall off. Understand that the collection agencies, there's a there are third third party entities, they do not pay full price for your debt. They're paying pennies on the dollar for your debt. Now, to take it a bit further, if 
you know, you decide, you know what, I, I want to purchase a home because all these people from California, they're coming here and they running up home prices. I really need to get in on this game, right? And so, you know, you have some collection accounts on your credit report and you want to deal with those accounts. So, you know, you have them validate the debt. If they're able to validate the debt and they say, this, this is your debt, this is your debt. Understand they bought your debt for 30 cents. So then what you want to do is negotiate. You want to call that collection um, agency and tell them, hey, okay, you validated the debt. That's my debt. Um, I have 40 cents that I want to pay. I have 40 cents today that I want to pay for this debt. Um, to get it off of my credit report and ask for a deletion. They don't have to do it, but you can ask for it. And that could be part of the negotiation, okay? So a couple of things here, either let it fall off, have them validate. If you decide that you're gonna take care of it because it's a new collection account, then um, negotiate with them with the understanding that they purchased it for pennies on a dollar, but when you call them, you have to make sure you have money in hand to take care of it. And if they can't work with you on it, you know, say, thank you very much. Don't take the conversation any further. Hang up the phone and go to the next um, account. Any questions there before we move on? We did get all the fives. Okay, all right. So what about employers? What are they looking for? So employers, you know, they're not going to pull a full credit report on you, but they will get a modified version of your credit report. And so they're going to look at your, your debt and your payment history. Um, and, and what are they looking for? They're looking for signs of financial distress, because we know when we stressed out, you know, in our personal lives, and you know, if it has to do with finances, how can we really focus at work? How can we really be our best at work? And so that's what one of the um, things that they use to um, filter out prospective um, employ employees. So, so say for instance, you know, I am pursuing my CFP. And so whenever I get ready to uh, complete my certification, do the test and all that, they're gonna do a background check on me. They're gonna check my credit report and they should check my credit report because I'm working with other people's money. Uh, my husband is an NFL uh, agent and part of um, keeping his certification every year, they do an extensive background check on him. If you're looking to go into cybersecurity or, you know, some, you know, tech a company and you know if, if they're having to expose you to their company trade secrets you you better bet that they're going to do a background check on you even in the military to get certain security clearances you know you want to have um your um uh credit where it should be and i like this quote from uh, this financial literacy guru uh, that I follow called the Bajanista. She say, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. So you don't want to get in a situation where like, oh, um, I'm getting ready to apply for this job. I need to hurry up and improve my um, credit score. Or I'm getting ready to buy a house. I need to hurry up and um, improve my credit score. No, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Um, other things they look look at is if you're using most of your available credit on your credit cards. And then if you have lots of uh, late payments. And so what that shows is that, you know, you're, you're mishandling your finances, you're, you're disorganized. That's what it shows. And then the other thing that, you know, I was looking at is that when you have, when your credit is messed up, creditors think that you're close to filing bankruptcy. That's what they're thinking. Okay. Now, what should we, you know, aim for as far as, um, credit score right here 750 and 850 if you're at 740 that's really good now let me let me tell you one thing so you can get a home when you're here right around 680 you can get a house but you know what your interest rate is going to be compared to someone who is here a huge difference. That's thousands of dollars that you would be paying compared to someone who has excellent credit. 
Um, and we will discuss ways in which you can improve your credit um, score. Okay, so don't worry about that. But you want to shoot for, you know, 740, 750, um, and, and that'll put you in a really good place. Components of uh, that three digit number. What are the five components of your credit score? So if I only had two seconds to talk to students about how to improve their credit, I would say definitely um, pay, pay your debt on time and then keep your credit card balances below 30% if you're unable to pay them off in full, okay? So your payment history, that's 35% of your credit score. That's a huge chunk. The other huge chunk, that's amounts owed. And so that's on your credit cards. It's the difference between um, your credit limit and your balance, right? And so if you have a, a credit card with the $1,000 credit limit, you wanna keep your balance below 30%. And when you go above 30%, then it, neg neg it will negatively impact your um, credit score. And so for you know, younger students who don't have a lot of you know, bills, expenses, or debt, and they're uh, starting to get into taking out credit cards and things like that, what we tell them, get in the habit of paying that credit card off in full, in full every single month. And then that way your amounts owed you know, will be at zero. The other part that's really important which is why I feel students should establish credit while they're in college is length of credit. So that's 15% of your credit score. And so let me give you an example of what happened uh, with my oldest son when he graduated from college. Um, you know, he was making a really good salary and decided that he wanted to purchase a car. He did not have any credit established. He didn't talk to, you know, my husband and myself about, you know, help him out, helping him out or anything like that. Um, but, but because he had the salary, they saw that he could afford to pay for that car. They let him finance it. And they got him with a 17% interest rate on that car. His car payment was close to $700 a month. And then on top of that, they made him pay a fee every single month when he made his car payment. So not only did he have a high interest rate, he had to pay an extra fee just to make that payment. And so this is why I feel like students, you know, don't be afraid to establish credit. Let us help you. Uh, understand how our credit systems work so that you can get some practice and then have some discipline and then you don't have to feel overwhelmed with how our credit systems work. The other part of um, that three digit number, the other component, that's your credit mix. And so your credit mix, that would be the type of credit that you have. Uh, revolving credit, that's one. So that's your credit cards. And then installment credit, that's the other. So your installment credit means that there's an end date, right? So we were talking about 15 year mortgages. So there's a time frame. Um, your student loans, there's, there's an end date on that, right? So 10 years on your student loans. Um, if it's a signature loan at the bank or if it's an auto loan, um, some people get those loans set up for four, four years or six years. So um, there's an end date. So with the revolving, you use it, you pay on it, you use it, you pay on it, there's no end date. So revolving, that's one type of credit. And then installment, that's another type of credit. And when you're looking to finance a home, they want to see that you have a really good mix of both and not just revolving credit. Um, when it comes to new credit, new credit is 10% of your credit score. So anytime you open up new credit lines, uh, it will impact your um, uh, credit by 10%. Now, how far can your credit score drop? And so let's look at 30 days late. So if you're 30 days late one time, and imagine that you have um, excellent credit, let's look at that. Okay. So if you're at 750, and then you're 30 days late one time, look at where you can be. I had a young man in one of my classes mention that his dad, decided to purchase a uh, co-sign for his girlfriend to get a car. And so he co-signed, you know, they weren't married. Girlfriend got the car, they broke up. 
and she was angry with them and decided she wasn't going to make those car payments. And so what happened with him, right? So of course he had the inquiry on his credit report. Then the late payments. And so you think about the late payments with car payments, okay? So if you're late one time, they're not going to come and repossess your car. I mean, you can be late, I think up to like 270 days. Um, and so let's just think about 30, 60, 90 days, 120 days late, okay? So you have that. And then uh, they come and repossess the car. So they did repossess that car. So you have that there. And then, but they still said they need their money. And so it, it went into collections, okay? So let's look at the credit score. So if you're at 750 and then you go here, right? The next thing, he, he's already there with very bad in the 300s um, because he decided to co-sign um, for someone. And that's another thing that we tell students is that you do not want to co-sign for anyone to, you know, um, to, get, to get a phone, to get a car, to lease an apartment, that sort of thing. Because if they decide that they're not going to make those payments or if they miss a payment, it's going to show up on your credit report and it's also going to uh, negatively impact your credit score. Okay. The other thing that you need to be aware of um, is how balance transfers can negatively impact your credit score. And so it will impact your credit score by 80% when you do those balance transfers um, because of the inquiry, um, opening up uh, a new account, and the, just the idea of a balance transfer. And so I tell students, you don't want to chase those 0% introductory rates on those credit cards when you don't have the discipline uh, to be able to do that. So what happens? You have a credit card. It's almost maxed out. You get an offer in the mail with 0% um, introductory rate uh, for one year. And so you, you, you transfer the balance from this card to this card, right? And so this card, you, you have a high balance on it because you transferred that high balance on over here. And then you're, you're probably using this card and then you see that you have some um, you know, credit available on this card and then you end up using this card too. So you just wanna be careful when it comes to balance, balance transfers because it can impact your credit score by 80%. We put that through uh, Credit Karma uh, credit simulation. It's a really good tool uh, to use on their website. The other um, impact and that's closing accounts. And so you wanna be super careful about closing accounts. I'm not opposed to closing accounts but you need to be aware of what can happen when you close, um, close out accounts. Okay, so say for instance, if you have a credit card that still has um, um, a balance on it and then you decide to close that account, it's going to impact not only your amounts owed, but also your length of credit. And so that's 45% of your credit score. And so back in the day, you know, for me, I'm part of Generation X, you know, when we went to college, there were credit card companies just posted up everywhere all across the campus. And, you know, a lot of people from my generation fell into that credit card trap, you know, they were they were having, you know, get all kinds of credit cards, you know, um, a lot of store credit cards. And so uh, when you end up with so many credit cards and then you get exposed to this kind of information, you're like, oh, I don't need all these credit cards. There's too many to keep up with. Well, you want to be careful about which credit cards you decide to close. And there's a calculation that you can do to determine which credit card to close. And that's why you want to set up an appointment with me <laughs> using my Calendly. Trisha, this would be a great opportunity uh, to drop that link in the chat as well. Let's talk about credit myths and um, how we've been able to bust these credit myths. And we have one question that came in mm -hmm. about the last part. Um, okay. How long does a settlement stay on your credit report? How long does it set? I, I would have to look that information up. Okay, all right. So we can look That's it up and get the information back to you. Yeah, we will have to Google that because I don't have that up there, settlements. All right, so canceling credit cards uh, boosts your credit score does not. Closing a credit card that you've had uh, for several years 
or that has a high credit limit can hurt your credit score and not help it. So like I said before, um, there's a calculation that you can do to determine which credit cards uh, to close. And so if you had a credit card that you've, you know, um, the balance is low, you got a good credit limit on there, the interest rate is good, you know, the terms and conditions are okay. Um, and so if it's your longest credit card, you definitely do not want to um, close that credit card. You share a credit score, credit report with your spouse, you do not. Now you can share credit um, accounts with your spouse. So say for instance, a mortgage or an auto loan, um, that can be shared, but your credit score, that's, that's on you, your credit report, that's on you, which is why you know, it's important um, to establish your own credit. And I'll say this too, when, when, when you're married and you're looking to purchase a home, when you go through the process of getting a mortgage, they're, they're not gonna merge your credit scores together. They're gonna go with the, the lowest credit score. So say for instance, if you have a 780 credit score and your spouse has a 560 credit score, they're gonna look at your spouse's 560 credit score. And then they're gonna say, you know, you can't get a mortgage with a 560 credit score. And so um, this is why it's important to not only establish your, your, your credit and, and make sure it's at it excellent, um, and then also protect your credit because you never know when, you, when you're gonna wanna um, decide to uh, finance something, you know, like a home or a vehicle, that sort of thing. Um, so here it says your credit history and scores never get merged with someone else's, even if you're married. That's why it's important to build your own credit as an individual. And I'll just say this, you know, I coach a lot of students and at ACC, we have non-traditional students. And I've seen where, you know, women are going through divorce. They've never had their name on anything. They don't have credit established. And so if you're a, a, a young woman uh, listening right now, and if you wanna figure out how to get your credit established, set up an appointment with me and I'll help you with that. You should carry a balance month to month on your credit card, you do not. You do not, and I get this question a lot from students. Um, when you carry a balance on your credit card, you pay interest and the interest rates on credit cards are just way too high. You don't wanna be giving that money away. And so I feel like, you know, it comes from the fact that if you don't use your credit card over an extended period of time, the credit card company, they can close your credit card. And so this is why we tell students, you know, when you, you, when you get a credit card, you wanna use it for reoccurring bills that you have anyway, or something that you have to pay anyway, like gas or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. So you're paying that every single month anyway. And so you're using it every month. But if you have something like, um, say for instance, a Kohl's card, and how often do you go to Kohl's? Hopefully not a whole lot, right? But if you're in a situation where you haven't been to Kohl's in maybe um, a year or so, and you haven't used that card, there's nothing preventing them from closing that card out, okay? So, and I think that that's where this myth comes from, where they say you should carry a balance on your credit card, and you, you don't have to. Um, if you use it consistently um, every single month and just paying it off in full every single month, uh, you should be fine. Uh, myth number four, checking your credit hurts your score. It does not because you're using a different platform and it's considered a, a soft pull um, or a soft inquiry compared to if you're trying to get something financed or you're trying to get a credit card, then they call that a hard pull and it will stay on your credit report for two years, okay? So checking your credit um, hurts your score, it does not. All right, so let's talk about credit cards. Um, credit cards can be a helpful tool if used wisely, but extremely damaging to your financial health 
if not used responsibly. And I'll just go back to Generation X, my generation, you know, we were running it up, not me personally, <laughs> but our generation, we were running it up when it came to uh, credit cards, you know, and, um, you know, it, 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 it can, like I said before, become extremely damaging. And let me just give you an example. So I had a young man that I had um, was coaching and we had a number of coaching sessions and he decided on his own to do a calculation to determine how much he was paying in interest only on his credit cards as well as on the car that he was financing. Now this is interest only, interest only, he was paying $1,000 a month just on interest, just on interest just on interest, just on interest. Imagine what you could do with $1,000 after going through one of my sessions, just on interest, okay? So you don't wanna play those reindeer games. We say pay close attention to the terms and conditions of your credit uh, card. So say for instance, you know, what's the interest rate? What's the statement date? What's the due date? How much will they charge me if I go over my limit? How much will they charge me for late payments? How much will they charge me if I pull money off of my card? You don't want to do those things. You don't want to pull money off your card. You don't want a late payment. You don't want to go over your limit, but you need to be aware of what those terms are, okay? Um, like we said before, pay off balances in full every single month. And then don't look at your uh, credit limit as an, ex as an extension of your income. So say for instance, you know, if you're making $45,000 a year and you have a credit card with a $10,000 credit limit, that's not $55,000 that you're working with, okay? So you don't wanna look at it that way. And then stay away from store credit cards. So sometimes I get pushback from students about this, but you know, I feel strongly, you don't need a store credit card. If you have a general purpose credit card, you can use your general purpose credit card anywhere. But if you have a Target credit card, where can, can you use your Target credit card at Walmart? I don't think so. If you can, let me know, okay? So stay away from store credit cards. How does credit cards work? So let's break this down even further. And you know, for me, when I, when I look at this almost every single day, it, it just reinforces why, you know, it's important to look at credit cards as a tool to establish credit. And you don't need a whole lot. Like for me personally, I only have one. I think having three credit cards, it's, it's okay. Three, you know, between two and three credit cards, it's okay. Um, I only need one. And that's me personally, because I don't like financing stuff like that. So let's just take a look at how credit cards work. So you have a credit card and you decide to uh, put a laptop and a printer on that credit card. Your balance is $2,000. You look at your budget, you're like, look, I can only afford to pay $60 a month on this. And with you being a, a young student, you know, you're gonna, they're gonna get you with high interest rates, right? So you're paying $60 a month. Um, your interest rate is $22.94%. $22 so that first $60 payment, what goes towards interest? is $37.06. What goes towards your principal? Just $22.94. And so if you were to do this every single month, just paying $60 a month, you're not gonna use the credit card ever again, but we know that's not the case because most Americans carry a balance on their credit card. But just for this example, you're not using a credit card until you get it paid off. How long will it take you to get that credit card paid off? Over four is four years and four months, okay, to get it paid off. And to borrow $2,000, you would have um, paid them an extra $1,180 just to borrow $2,000 for a laptop and for a computer, okay? And so, you know, that's how they hit us, right? I tell students all the time, we live in a capitalistic society and for a capitalistic society to run correctly, you need consumers. And so they want us consuming all the time. And if you don't have the cash money to consume, they're like, hey, you can consume on credit. 
you know, those monthly payments. And that's how they get us all the time. And so you just don't want to be in the habit of, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a monthly payment on my credit card. I got my furniture. I'm making monthly payments on my car. I got my month, monthly payments. That is just taking everything away from your income. And so you don't want to have that happen. So with this, just get in the habit of paying off your credit cards in full every single month and you do not want to pay this high interest. It's just a lot. It's just a lot of interest. Um, and then these are the interest rates on certain types of credit cards. And if you look at the store credit cards, um, I actually think that they have gone up to 29%. Um, but June, June, oh, this is as of June 2020. So it's 24.20%. But it'll be different for, you know, um, if it's Walmart, if it's Target, uh, if it's Forever 21, Victoria's Secret, it'd be different. And then here's the deal, like with these store credit cards, they don't really care about your credit score. They just want to make sure that you have a pulse because they're going to take theirs off top. And so credit cards are considered un unsecured debt. And because it's unsecured, that's why they charge so much in interest compared to, you know, when you're financing a car and you have good credit or a mortgage, okay? Now, ways to um, establish credit or improve credit. So a couple of things. Now, I've had conversations with students who want to improve their credit because they want to um, get a mortgage. So these are some of our older students. And so the first thing, and I got this from um, my realtor friend who is actually the, um, uh, she's on the board. So she's the board of direct, on the board of directors for, um, you know, Austin's real estate establishment. And so for, for them, they said that if you're looking to improve your credit or establish your credit, you want to open what's called a secure credit card. And we're going to go into detail about how to do that. So you can do that. And then if you want to take it a step further because you're trying to build credit, you know, within the next year or two to purchase a home, then you can apply for what's called a, a credit builder loan at your credit union. And this is another thing. As, a, as an ACC student, you can become a member of our local credit unions, University Federal Credit Union, A Plus Federal Credit Union. Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Union, there's a number of credit unions you can become members of. You want to establish a relationship with the credit union because that's where you're going to get the best interest rates to, to finance a car and to also finance a loan, uh, home. And so if you're looking to do those things, what better place to um, establish a relationship with the credit union, getting a secure credit card, or applying for a credit builder loan. The other thing that you can do is um, become an authorized user on a parent's credit card. But you need to make sure that that parent is really good with handling their money and they're not gonna add you as an authorized user on a credit card where they've been missing payments and you know maxing out the card, that sort of thing. So let me just give you an example. So our son, when we found out how much his interest rate was, you know, we decided to make, make him, as well as our youngest son, authorized users on one of our credit cards that had um, a really high credit limit, zero balance, very long credit history. All that was, when we made them authorized users, they, they, they benefited from um, all that credit history, um, high credit limit, low balance. And so what happened with my youngest son, when he graduated, from college, he graduated with the 830 credit score, an 830 credit score. And so for my, my siblings who have um, uh, young adult children, I have them do this for them, you know, because what better way to have, you know, credit established, a credit history established before you start making those moves out into society, okay? Now, secured credit cards. The interest rates on secured credit cards are um, high as well, but yeah. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you. Um, <laughs> so why Sorry, you, um, Aisha, I, I muted back. you by accident instead of the new student. Uh -huh. So can you unmute yourself now, Aisha? 
Okay, I'm you. Okay. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. I clicked on the wrong mute button. Did y'all hear what I had to say? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> say it again. Is it on this slide? So everything on this slide. Okay, so with 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 secure credit cards, it's a powerful tool to build credit and then to also rebuild credit. Okay. Um, so what you'll do is you'll put down a deposit. So your deposit, that's going to be your credit limit. And with mo most uh, companies, most, um, most banks, credit unions, when you've had that card for six months or longer and you've been using it responsibly, what they'll do is turn that secure credit card into a general purpose credit card and refund you your money, okay? It works, looks, feels, behaves just like a general purpose credit card, so you don't have to be ashamed of it. Um, and then it does report to all three credit reporting agencies, and it takes about a year to improve your credit if you do it this way, okay? Because I know a lot of times students will get a credit card and they're being super careful, which is great. It's, it's always great to be super careful, but they're not using it consistently. And then, so the key is, is that you wanna use it consistently and just pay it off in full um, every single month. So let me show you how to do that. So with your secure credit card, oh, do I still have the, oh, come on, what's happening? I can't move my slide anymore. Um, you want to stop share and share again to see if that, yeah, we'll sometimes do that, that works. We'll do that. We'll do that. Stop share, share again. Okay. Why? Did your computer freeze? I don't know. Let me see. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. And we're going to take a pause. If there's any questions that y'all have, we're coming up close to the end of the presentation. If you want to go ahead and put some questions in the chat. So when Aisha gets her presentation back up, we'll have a list of questions for her. Okay, so can y'all see my screen now? I know you'll have to hit share screen again. Okay, let's do, let's go here. Share screen. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> it's not working. What's happening? Uh, I don't know what's happening here. That is no. weird. Do you, you want to share it with me real quick and I can share my screen and click through? Well, all right. So I can explain this. Okay. Okay. So with the secure credit card, what you'll want to do is put down your deposit. Your deposit can be between $300 and I think up to $1,000. It depends on um, you know, where you go through, if it's with the bank or credit union, okay? And then what you'll do is you'll pick um, a reoccurring bill that you pay anyway. So it could be your Netflix, Amazon a streaming service, a streaming service or your gas, all right? So if it's with a streaming service, you wanna put a credit card down anyway. You do not want to put your debit card down. And that's another thing that I tell students. When it comes to making purchases online and doing things online, you do not wanna put your debit card down because if somebody steals your uh, account information, they can drain your account. And then if you have, you know, um, uh, bills connected to that account, it can really mess you up. And so if you put a credit card down, they steal your information, uh, you're covered, you're covered. Uh, the credit card companies can reimburse you. So you wanna be super careful with that. So you have your, um, your, your secure credit card connected to your Netflix account is auto pay. And so what we say is, Go to your checking account, you know, with your bank or your credit union, and then do an auto pay from your uh, checking account to that secure credit card. Okay. And then every single month when, you know, your Netflix payment uh, is due, you're using a low 
amount of your credit limit, right? With that reoccurring. So you want to use just a, a tiny amount. And then every single month, your um, uh, it's being paid from your checking account. So you want to do an auto pay there. And then all of that is being reported to the three credit reporting agencies. So a couple of things. You're not only making the payment, but you're paying in full. And then you're using, you have a low utilization. And so that is what boosts your score. And then because you're doing it every single month, um, they call that the jump man card where you can do that. And then I say, put the, put the, put the card in the drawer and don't use it for anything else. You know, uh, just pick one thing uh, that's reoccurring and uh, use it with that card. And so we're at, um, at the hours mark. I still have two hours work, worth of content to share. <laughs> we didn't even let that pan down that, but here's the deal. Um, my Calendly is in the chat. Uh, if you want to learn more or for me to continue with the presentation, because you want to learn more, you can set up um, a coaching session uh, with me during the month of April or uh, the month of May. Any questions? <laughs> 